Hey everybody, welcome to Oregon State University Permaculture Design Pro Spring Summer Office Hours. This is our eighth or ninth office hour. We're getting closer and closer to the end as we go. And today we're gonna answer a few questions and if we get some time, we're gonna go over the local plant survey and then the plant design. So this will be one of the first opportunities coming up for the next assignment to design and put things into practice and start to collate everything that we've gone through in terms of the assignments and the assessments and the observations, and really start to put things down on the paper. So our first, and I believe our only question today is from Victor, who unfortunately due to um, connectivity uh, issues won't be able to be reaching us today. So I'm just going to share my screen, show his question. And there we go. So Victor writes, Hello, Javin, I'm having a serious connectivity issue here, so I've not been able to upload my assignments, nor will be able to come online this evening as a consequence. Nevertheless, here are a few questions. I think I need additional guidance on human waste management. Please advise what strategies we can use to employ a comprehensive manage to comprehensively manage human waste in an off-grid manner that does not require municipal support. And two, I'm also wondering what restrooms, toilet design options are available to us. Communities here tend to construct and use pit latrines. I don't think they're the best solution we have available, but I'm not really clued in on more reliable alternatives out here. Yeah. Great question and um, gets into composting toilets and human waste management and just management in general. Um, funny enough, I'm uh, I'm out on the coast of British Columbia for the last week, um, hanging out with a very good friend and colleague who was actually one of my instructors at my PDC in 2009. We've become fast friends and you'll find that if you if you dive into the world of permaculture, regenerative agriculture, uh, your friend groups start to include people who own and work with farms and animals. And so you end up going and visiting and you end up working on these places and, and sharing a lot of connectivity because um, I don't know if I've said this yet in this group, but uh, one of the reasons I've stayed in permaculture as a occupation vocation calling is that I've met just the most incredible people. And um, last night I was hanging with um, Brandon, my very good friend and, and former teacher. And uh, we were talking about how when we worked in Kenya, we were working with this amazing man named Joseph Barasa uh, out of um, Batula Busia, Kenya. And um, his pit toilets are some of the scariest uh, places in the world. Uh, the amount of fauna that live in those pit toilets makes it a very undesirable uh, impulse to use them. And it took a lot of convincing to move him to what's called drop composting toilets. Um, but we did so, and I think he's, you know, he's seen the light, but it's hard to switch what you already have in place. And this is why making good decisions up front will allow you to not have temporary solutions become permanent frustrations, let's call it. Um, and this happens a lot. I don't know if, if anybody else has experienced this, but I remember once I was tasked with making a, a latch for a gate in a community I was living in. And uh, in community, you always have to talk about everything. And we ended up, well, I proposed a, a, a very simple wood latch system, um, but it would take a bit of time, take some resources. They're like, I just put a string and a nail on it. And once you know it, 13 years later, it's what's still there. <laughs> so you really have to think about um, long-term solutions when we're working with this thing. So for Victor, um, and especially in, in, in East Africa, I find that drop composting toilets are uh, probably one of the better solutions. You can also do drop composting toilets that have a bucket system where uh, Milkwood did this quite well and others. And there was an Australian company that was working in festivals. I think they were called Thunder Toilets. And basically they had these big wheelie bins that I think in North America we use mostly for municipal garbage and recycling and composting pickups. You know, they're, you know, three, three feet tall, it's kind of a foot and a half, two feet wide. And basically they're wheeled underneath the toilet seat and the hole. Um, they have some aeration at the bottom. They usually have a great lift. And then they've got a, a valve to take off liquid. And basically you fill that up and when you make your deposit, you're always adding carbon because our feces and especially our urine 
is high in nitrogen. And so we're trying to balance that usually with um, wood shavings or, or wood chips. Now, Joe Jenkins wrote the Human Your Handbook, which is a seminal resource on this and has made it available for free electronically online. Everyone can have a copy. Makes for great bathroom reading. That is the, um, the necessary joke to always say when talking about the Human Your Handbook. And then a good colleague and friend of mine, Gord Baird, wrote the um, Essential Guide to Composting Toilets, which if you're looking at a wider range of implementations, if you're looking at houses, if you're looking at off-grid situations where maybe composting toilets don't make sense and you need to use something like an incinolet, which is an incinerator toilet, he basically goes through the entire scope and scale and design matrix. In fact, um, Gordon and I are going to be very soon offering a composting toilet workshop, which will go into that that huge matrices of understanding what to do and work with. And it'll be great for engineers and urban planners, uh, but also for folks who are just working on it. So I would suggest, Victor, that you that you work with a, a drop toilet system, which means that you've got a building or you've got a raised platform that then has a building around it because privacy is is always um always necessary. And then you have a number of holes <clears throat> and a number of stalls and a number of toilet seats and whatnot, all depending on what your, um, where you are in the world and what your defecation routine is. Um, you know, you move into Western countries, we like to sit down, you move into Eastern countries and, and definitely Eastern Africa, and it's more of a squatting conversation. So it just really depends on what your cultural um, behaviors are around that. And in terms of carbon material, what you'll want to have is some kind of ready available uh, carbon materials. And so in a lot of the composting toilets that I've built and worked with and used, um, we're using wood shavings. Um, you don't want kiln dried wood shavings. The reason for this is that they're usually too dry and they don't have a small uh, amount of moisture to them. And so the moldering that happens, and this is important to understand, is that a lot of composting toilets aren't actually composting. They molder, they, they're places to sit, and then we usually put them into a composting system afterwards. The great thing about a drop toilet is that with these different holes, you have also different receptacles beneath them. And those receptacles, basically, you are occluding the holes at different times of year when those receptacles are full. And that way they can compost over time. So basically, when you fill up a receptacle, you basically um, put a piece of plywood or a piece of wood over that or remove the toilet seat or you know whatever that cultural behavior is. And then you move on to the next one. And then that compost pile will sit for two years minimum. First year is what's called a mesophilic compost, which is a hot compost. Uh, this means that the mesophiles, that's all the different heat loving, uh, thermophilic, right? Thermophilic than mesophilic, pardon me. Um, uh, thermophilic because it has a hot year one uh, and all the thermophiles will be in there and they'll be working through the compost and uh, creating bioturbation, which is the turning of it and all the rest of it. And then into year two, what you usually do is you flip it. So basically the outside becomes the inside and all of you will have seen the composting videos by now and know that when we do pile composting or uh, cube composting in our three bin composting system or the Berkeley composting system after that first year that outside material becomes the inside of a new pile and then that inside becomes the outside because you want full decomposition uh, and then that second year then we go into mesophilic which is a, a medium heat and this is usually where we develop a lot more of our fungals so a lot of our fungals can't grow and operate at high temperatures. So that mesophilic allows the fungals to develop. And then at that point, that compost is largely ready. So we've taken uh, human waste and we've turned it into um, compost. And um, Gord, who has been testing his human ear compost for many years, has had it come back at a higher um, a higher safety reading, a rating, uh, as opposed to what compost is rated for in British Columbia, Canada, uh, than commercial compost, which uh, is not allowed to have human waste come into it. So you can do it right. It doesn't have to smell. It's rather easy to do. Uh, one of the main things you have to make sure of is that after you make your deposit, you flush with carbon material. That means um, the whatever you put into the receptacle uh, and any toilet paper is covered 
with that carbon material. And if you do it that way, it tends to have zero to no smell, um, but you can install a vent. So basically it's just a piped vent that comes out of that receptacle, usually through the platform that you're sitting on and goes up and through the roof and through just thermal convection will, will take up any, um, any undesirable odors. The other thing that Gord did at his house, which is eco-sense.ca and highly recommend people check out his two-story Cobb load-bearing building, which was the first in North America to be built um, some decade ago. Um, he has a milliamp fan that's inside his vent tube that is connected to a dead man switch in the door. So that way when the door is closed, the milliamp fan automatically turns on and basically vents any undesirable odors directly uh, to atmosphere. So that's coming in, that's switching, that's compost and then use. So in terms of use, you generally, the, the rule of thumb is that we're only putting human ear compost onto um, woody perennials or trees. And the reason for this is we never want that compost just as a, a, a very last safeguard. If we've done it perfectly right, it, it should be fine. But just one last piece is if we're going to apply it onto woody perennials, shrubs, brambles, things like that, um, then we know that it's never going to come in contact with any vegetative matter that we are actively eating or putting into our mouths. And um, as my old uh, scout master and then um, uh, advanced outdoor wilderness first aid training and then EMT training always used to say the majority of people who get gastrointestinal illnesses um, are, are, are due to eating their own or the cook's poop. And uh, it was it was well learned. Unfortunately, it was a hard lesson to learn when I was younger. Um, just due to hygiene and washing hands and things of that nature. So we really want to keep that material separate from lettuces, brassicas, root crops, you know, things that, that may come into contact with um, the kitchen. And so normally what we do is we'd pull back the mulch from around our plants um, and we'd put on, you know, an inch of compost usually in the fall or the spring or both depending on their feeding requirements, heavy feeders, both times light feeders one time and then put the mulch back on top and there you go that's the use of it as well a couple of considerations is you want the recept receptacle to be one of two things you either want to divert the urine which if you take a look for urine diverters uh, they're usually um gender non-specific so basically the form of how they're created and how they worked will catch both um uh, both sexes urine but will separate out any feces um, or if you have them together you just have to vary you have to make sure that you have um, that total flush so to speak of carbon material so it covers um, all of your deposits so to speak if you do separate it out and uh, you separate out the urine urine can be applied at uh, anywhere from one to two to one to ten in terms of one part urine two parts water, one part urine, 10 parts water to the garden um, and is a very available, um, very available fertilizer as uh, ammonia and nitrogen for um, the garden. And so it works really, really well. Um, what else did he say here? Communities here tend to construct and use pit latrines. I don't think they're the best solution we have available. Yeah, so definitely drop toilets has been my experience. And those receptacles are great because you don't have to move around bins and forget about them. And yeah, that would be my answer about that. Um, what else could I say about it? If you do go with a bucket system or go with a bin system, with buckets, it's the same conversation in terms of the whole process, except for the fact that when the bucket's filled, um, you usually bring it out to your pile that you're working with and um, deposit it there. And then you're just back into your regular composting system. And uh, again, Joe Jenkins has some great materials on how to build the lovable loo, which is his go-to toilet system, and then the human your hacienda, which is the composting system, three-bin composting system outside, and how to rinse buckets and how just to keep a level of hygiene. That's really amazing. So yeah, uh, that's what I would say. For everybody that's on the call, is there any further questions about that or follow-up thoughts? Uh, I would have a question to composting human your. Uh-huh. Thanks, Chris. 
Um, so I, I used the Joe Jenkins method last year. So basically we had several buckets, they're 20 liters. And whenever five to six buckets were full, we emptied them into a, a compost pile that was surrounded by straw and it worked perfectly fine. I had a compost thermometer in it. It heated up to around 55 Celsius um, usually. So I was pretty happy that it looks safe. Now this year I did exactly the same, but my compost pile never really got above 30 Celsius. And I don't really, so troubleshooting wise, I know that it can be a lack of nitrogen as far as I know, but given that we don't separate the urine, that shouldn't really be a cause. Lack of moisture could be a cause if I'm aware, but I, whenever I rinse the buckets, just as Joe Jenkins does, I also put the cleaning water on top of it, not the one that was cleaned also with biodegradable chemicals, but just the pure rinsing. So it was wet enough and the kitchen scraps also went into it. The pile was also big enough. It was a couple of, it was over a hundred liters by the end. So I think it should be enough volume. And I'm pretty clueless troubleshooting wise what it could be now. I know it could be a tricky question, but I was just wondering if maybe off the top of your head, you have a couple of pointers what I could have done wrong. That's such a good question. Um, so it was, it was done in the same sort of three bin system um, was there any diet changes over the last year for the people who are contributing? No, no, pretty much same, same diet, mostly the same meals. In fact, now that I think about it, so not, not really, it's a different season. So this time we started in spring and last year we did it in summer. So we did it for two months last year, summer. Now we did two months in spring, but I mean, the ambient temperature fair, it got under zero degrees beginning of April, but by the end, when we left, it was over 30 Celsius. So the ambient temperature, don't reckon, could make such a big difference. Okay. So no diet change either. Yeah, and and the same the same bins, like everything was the same in terms of use. So the material going in was the same, the people and the diet was the same. The only thing that changed was the time of year. Is that right? Pretty much, yeah. Now, off the top of my head, that's the only change that comes to my mind. I mean, there must might also be something else, but nothing of the big variables I can point my finger to. Huh. Yeah, that's a stumper. Um, I guess the only thing that I would start to think about without connecting with others, and I will, I'll um, I reach out to Gordon, see if he has any thoughts about it. But oh, nice. Thank you. I, I wonder if um, just that temperature has an issue with um the types of uh, facultative aerobes that would be working on the pile and i wonder if it's a bit of a seasonal shift where you have to add some soil to it um mm. during that spring season whereas in the summer season you don't just due to the the temperature and the heat or maybe you need to add greens to it so yeah you already have kitchen scraps and you have the humanure but maybe you need to add some of the fresh growth around you, any of the bioaccumulators that you you have on site that grow quite a lot of vegetative matter, mm -hmm. just chop and drop directly into that when you're emptying maybe you know two or three buckets, put in a layer of that. I just, usually when compost doesn't reach temperature, if we're not just focusing on human or compost, it's usually because the greens are low. So mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the greens, you know, just from doing it remotely and talking about it, I would say, I would take a look at your green ratio and see if you can't, you know, increase it by 50%, 80%, 100% and be, be methodical about it. So, you know, the next time you put in a bucket, if you add, you know, half a bucket of greens to it as well, uh, to, to check the temperature to see if you can get to that upper, upper 50 C lower uh, 60s because that's really that that genius spot you're looking for usually 58 uh, celsius is when you want to do a turn or a move but that would be my only thought is that the green ratio is off and it's weird of course because nothing's changed but yet um from uh an ecology perspective everything's changed because the season's different and the different um actually there is one change it's okay. a new compost pile so it's at a different spot in the garden but oh. it's like 10 meters away from the other pile that's still composting. So maybe also some of the, but vegetation wise, it's not a, like it's not a different microclimate nor a particularly vegetatively different either, but maybe it's got something to do with, with that. Is the solar real estate the same? 
Come again? Is the solar real estate the same? Is it is it seeing the same amount of sun as the previous pile? I would say maybe a bit less. So it's a bit more shaded. Could be it. You know, could be it. Um, I would I would try the green solution. Don't change anything else because, of course, when we're trying to tr uh, troubleshoot, we only want to change one variable, and then see what the change is. Um, continue to mark your um, your temperatures, and uh, I'll reach out to Gord see what he has to say. Perfect. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Good to see you, or good to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I would put the webcam on. But I'll be honest. I'm sitting in my van, and it's 50 degrees, so I don't have a t-shirt on, and I'm pretty sure that's not Zoom etiquette. So I had to make worries. a choice between the two. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, anybody else? Follow-up question on uh, composting toilets, heating your uh, toilets. Okay. All right, let's jump back into the questions. Ali from Montana. Hello, Javin. For the plant system design assignment, should we be looking at the entire site or just a section of the site? If just a section, should we focus on zone one? Great question. So we have a zone one assignment coming up <clears throat> where you'll design the zone one. And that includes not just plants, but hardscapes or integration elements or even um, retrofitting for energy. Uh, so that plant system design is kind of the first step in design and it can be as simple as a single guild. So you could take a single tree or a single plant in your landscape and say, well, I wanna design something around it and start quite small. Um, you could take a particular production area. Say you were trying to create a food forest and you want to start to get a sense of what the rows might be or what the general shape would be. You could start with that. Uh, but basically what we're trying to do is get a sense of a small amount of design, start to get you thinking about sectors and zones and influences crossed with uh, accessibility and maintenance, uh, as well as client desires and regulations. We're trying to, to put all these things together. So, um, you could focus on one area within zone one, but definitely don't do all of zone one because zone one is a separate assignment. Or you could focus on a small plant design that is um, something that you feel is a nice first step. And some people take on the thing they think that might be the hardest, like, well, I've got a walnut tree and I'm trying to figure out what, what works with the allopathic jug loans that it creates. And so trying to figure out ribes and, and savory herbs and things like that that work really well. So it's uh, not just zone one, you can do it anywhere, but generally you want to create a, um, a, a design that's relatively small in scope and scale. So we're not doing a whole food forest, we're, we're just doing, you know, a, a single planting, or we're doing a single plant selection and what might go well with it. Does that make sense, Ali? Yeah, that answers my question. Okay, cool. Thanks. Any follow up? Okay, awesome. All right, uh, any other uh, spontaneous questions before we go through um, local plant survey and uh, plant design? Okay, awesome. So uh, jumping in here, we've got our uh, local plant survey. And so one of the first things we're going to do is take a look at the medicinal plants. Uh, minimum of three, you can go more but we're trying to understand a, a bit of the plants in the area that could be used medicinally. And one of the columns here is personal use. So we're also trying to start to engage you in thinking about plants as medicine, as we have for the majority of our uh, species uh, lifespan on the planet. Um, and start thinking about how they may work or not work with others. So the precautionary and uh, contra indicators is important as well because some plants um, uh, there are issues so for example I, I harvest and create tincture out of Hypericum perforatum which is St. John's wort and it is a, a mood alterer uh, it's kind of like bottling the sunshine in the summer and giving it back to us usually in the winter in temperate climates uh, but it does have some contra intra indications with, um, with SSRI so if you are on more pharmaceutical um, 
antidepressants, you have to be careful because they, they can have some issues or some compatibility. Uh, we're looking for the parts that would be used, the properties or actions, what is the common use and illustrative pictures, some great examples over in the right-hand side there. Uh, then we're going to be taking a look at a local plant survey. So what are some traditional seasonal foods that have been eaten or used in your area? And this could be um, from indigenous or, or ancestral uses. Uh, just starting to get a sense of, you know, what was here and what is that food? Um, it's common uh, these days that the majority of our calories come from three different plants, from wheat, from corn, from rice. And the problem with that is that it's not a very diverse diet. It doesn't give us a lot of options. And, uh, excuse me. And when we take a look at hunter and gatherers, they, they had in excess of a hundred to 200 plants that they would receive their nutrition from. So we want to start to open up the, the mind to these different elements. And I am going to take a quick break and just have a quick, uh, new, Okay, thanks for the break. Um, local nurseries, where we want you to start to take a look at what are the local areas that, and the local nurseries that are in your area, what are places that you could source plants from? These can be local or commercial. And then what are the local farms? There's four farms in your area that you'd be comfortable comfortable purchasing your food from. Again, we're starting to think about what's called the food shed. So I run a um, family food security program out of regenerative living. And um, that program, we go, we have an entire almost three weeks where we get people to look at their food shed. Where does our food come from? How far does it come from? Where do we eat? Where do we stop for that quick bite on the way home? And by starting to observe and measure your food shed, you can start to manage it and you can start to slowly shift it away from or into places that um, are uh, more in line with your values or with your morals. As usual, do a SWOT analysis. So what are some of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for the medicinal plants, for the indigenous plants or the traditional plants that can be eaten or used in the area of nurseries and also of farms? And then really, what does that then say about your site? And then we get into plant design. <clears throat> so we're going to be using this um, this approach for all of the design processes from here on in. So we'll have a statement of purpose first and foremost. So it's a uh, short sense to describe the purpose of your design. For example, increase climate resilience, improve health, soil, enhance wildlife, habitat, producing edible perennial crops. Just, you know, what are the general, the general purpose of this design? So if you're doing a guild, it could be, um, I wanna support uh, a key production species like a apple or a pear or a plum or an avocado. Um, or maybe it's I'm looking at creating a replicable uh, food force design and I'm starting to think about what I want the rows to look like. I'm not going to go into all the details of the plantings. We'll do that later in maybe the final design, but I just want to start to think about it. So you can also use this <clears throat> assignment to build and complex into your final design or, or design of your zone one. Uh, goal one, so insert a short sentence to describe your number one goal. Use bold caption to highlight keywords. For example, reduce microclimate, extremes, etc. Indicate in detail what patterns could be used to reach your goal. For example, there could be a pattern of block wind or capture winter solar heat or reduce summer solar input. Basically, what is that pattern we're looking at? So when we talked about patterns at the beginning of the course, they were general uh, forms and structures that we may want to be thinking about. We don't quite know what it'll be yet. We're trying to go from patterns to details, always in permaculture design. So really thinking about that, that big idea. And then the strategy. So what could be the solution for block winter wind? Well, the strategy could be a windbreak um, using something like deciduous trees or doing uh, like instead of a hedge, a fedge, a food hedge, something that not only provides blockage of wind or maybe a privacy block, but also creates a lot of food. And it could be food and food for us. It could be fodder for wildlife or cut fodder for animals for grazing. Um, could be pharmaceuticals, could be dyes, could be coppiceable uh, material that we can cut and come again. So 
you know, that kind of gives you that sense of it. And you could have multiple goals. You have, could have two, three, four, five, six, eight goals, all depending on sizing on the slide. You may need to create another slide. And then what we're looking for here is the plan view of the existing site or a portion of the existing site. Your map needs to clearly show the existing conditions, but you can also throw in some of the patterns here. So this is a great, um, uh, this is a great example from Lauren here where she put in some of those different patterns and strategies already kind of giving us a sense. And this was a tight cut in to a certain area on the site. So you can see here, she gave us the plan and then she gave us a call out. So a little detail of what we're looking at. And in here, she gave us an existing orchard uh, element. So she also put in what are the existing conditions there. And then we're going to get into the plant design itself. So what are the different elements of that plant design? Now, um, if you're going to put in the plant design, I highly recommend you take the next step. It's not required uh, in the assignment, but I highly recommend you do it. Uh, it's talk about water. How are you going to passively water harvest on this planting? How are you going to actively um, irrigate this? Almost all plants will need at least a year or three of supplemental irrigation. Um, and everyone says what hand watering, but until you hand water something, you just don't realize how much water and maintenance it'll take. So sure enough, the old saying that the farmer's shadow or the gardener's shadow is the best fertility because of uh, eyes on the planting. But at the same time, it's a lot of time and energy. And basically anything that can go wrong that's based on the uh, human mind to remind yourself to go and keep something alive will eventually fail. So just keep that in mind. And here again, we've got a great example. Um, Lauren's shown us pathways and new implementations, uh, different areas that might be used and really given us a sense, pulled out some net and pen or smiley berm um, uh, swales here just to show the different elements. Also including a legend of the new plants and really using a per plant abbreviated legend is, is brilliant and is something we should all start to practice. So a couple pieces here, notes on proposed plants, speak about water management, uh, note about soil fertility and comment on access. So biggest issues people make when they're doing plant system design. One, they don't give, your, they don't give access. They plant too crowded and there's not enough access to get in. So one of the major issues is, is we've got these beds that are like four, five, six, 10, 12, 13, 14 feet deep, three, four meters deep, and you can't get in there. You can't access it. And if this is a planting that isn't just based on aesthetics, that once you set it and forget it, it's perennial, it's annual self-sowing, then if you can't get into it and harvest the materials, it's never really going to work out. So really think about access and then think about what is the um, what needs to be accessed or, or put another way, is it a, a person that needs to get in there or is it a wheelbarrow or is it a truck? So really think about how you're going to access these different areas. The second thing that almost without fail, people don't add enough of is nitrogen fixers. So usually if I'm doing tree design, I want to have shrub or tree nitrogen fixers. If I'm doing shrub, I want shrub or ground cover nitrogen fixers. Um, or both. Uh, I usually like a backup. Um, the number of people who will uh, give me a tree design and say, I put in beans or peas, it's enough nitrogen. It's not. You need to think about having that same level, especially if we're working at a production model, like we want to produce fruit or we want to produce leaf. Um, really think about having multiple nitrogen fixers. And again, the natural capital plant database is a great place to go for nitrogen fixers or plants for a future. <clears throat> Something here that's important is uh, ensure all existing plants are represented in grayscale. This is essential to show what is existing grayscale and what is new in color. So this is really important. Make sure to show your pre-existing plant in grayscale so that way the new pops out. So this is a cross section. So we've done this before. Uh, we're going to insert a cross section of the plant design, um, showing the different elements and conversations there. So this is, well, that's interesting. It really wants to go back up to the other one. Maybe we can zoom in and it'll let me move over. There we go. So this is a great example of a cross section. And I highly recommend everyone put in if you're doing a north-south uh, cross-section to put in your solar 
um, your solar uh, lines. So putting in your winter and your summer solstice and just showing what that shading is going to look like. Uh, this is something we do a lot in our studies uh, when we're when we're thinking about, especially production models, we're trying to see, you know, are the trees both going to have the majority of their sun and shade? And um, Lauren did a great job of even showing that shade in the winter, which is brilliant. I love how she did this. And then we want you to list the plant species you're using and subdivide them into the canopy, the subcanopy, the shrubs, kind of showing each. You can do this in a single matrices or you can put it into um, each separate slide. So you can do one slide as the canopy, one slide as subcanopy, one slide as shrub, one side as ground cover, one slide as vines um, or in ground. And this is an example of that. So this is just an example. Um, this uh, and it says it here on the side. It's so interesting. It doesn't want to move over. This is an example of a completed plant species matrix. Use it for reference and then delete it or add it to your appendix before you submit this assignment. Again, we want to have all your sources. We've got water needs here and light needs and then some illustrative photos. And then we're talking about elemental interrelationships. So how does each of your plants relate to each other? Why did you put them there? Um, and really think about the permaculture principle of needs and yields. You know, one element provides benefits to the other and they have more interconnection. Um, remember that the element within ecology that makes itself of highest value to the most number of other elements within that ecology usually survives. This is true of people as well. So we want to keep that in mind as we're moving through this. Design facilitation management. How is maintenance considered within your plant design? How will you maintain the system? How does this design be watered or installed into the future? So those are important consider considerations as well. We want to think about the future. Bill Mollison called permaculturalist time scouts. We're looking into the future. We're trying to understand how this will develop. And that takes research. If you've never done it before, you have to think, well, how big is this going to grow? And will it shade out others? Uh, upon planting, we usually do a, anywhere from a two to a three to a five to one for support plants. So sometimes when we're planting out um, trees in particular, I'll overplant alders and cut them down over time as our key species gets larger because those alders are supported what's called companion plants for what we're creating. So that, that can be part of your design. If you want to show the staging management of that, you can and definitely something I recommend but not necessary for the rubric or the grades for this. Water and irrigation, how will this design be watered on installation and into the future? And what passive or active rainwater harvesting elements have you integrated into your design and why? As Brad Lancaster wisely said, plant the water, then plant the plant. So make sure you have those elements in, in stock and in place, and then you can move forward from there. Now, remember, once we get into design, the SWOT is about your design. So the SWOT is what is the strengths that you see in your design? What are the weaknesses you see in your design? What are the opportunities in your design? And what are some threats to your design? No design is perfect. Nobody creates a perfect design, it doesn't exist. There's always gonna be an element there. So you have to think, well, maybe it's that the client doesn't know a lot about these plants or maybe I'm brand new and I might be making mistakes. All of that makes good sense in terms of starting to become quite humble about this work. And if I haven't told anybody this, my biggest aha moment in my design career was learning how to take my designs and offer them to others, other colleagues and um, designers, give them a red pen and say, tell me why I'm wrong. And it was one of the, the pivotal aha and evolution moments in my design work because I opened myself to being wrong and I think it was last week with the other class, I was talking about this and saying, especially in this course, you have a great opportunity to reach out to your classmates and say, hey, I want to create a little red team design collective and we can all pass our designs to each other and kind of go beyond the more polite uh, peer reviews that are necessary in this course, but really say, okay, tell me why I'm wrong or challenge me on this or really make me um, defend what I'm doing here. And this happens a lot in architecture school, landscape architectural school, you have to go above a judge and the jury, they judge your work, you have to defend it. And if you can get into that mindset early, you can get out of this, oh, it's got to be perfect on the first time. All designs are iterative. There's no such thing as a final design. 
Uh, no plan survives inception and especially not with ecology. You put a plant in, it dies. You put in two or three plants and a plant, you've created a niche and a plant that's in the genetic bank of that, that place blooms. It, it's always going to be moving. And so we make our, our best guess and our, our, our best interpretation and we put it into play and we see what happens. So really do think about these as working designs. These are not final designs, there's no such thing. And then again, any questions that come up from that. So we can put that in there. Um, one tidbit of advice that I wish I had learned earlier is for aesthetic design, which I was not so focused on when I started. I was much more pragmatic and more, has to be efficient, has to be um, what we need, but things that are beautiful get managed. And so if you can add beauty to your design, if you can add color, if you can add fragrance, um, a colleague of mine was just telling me about this, this new, um, this new nitrogen fixer he's growing, which is um, Morphia fruticose, which is a nitrogen fixer gets to about 15 feet tall, you can cut it, it comes again, and it has very aromatic blooms, yellow, uh, pink blooms, beautiful amazing. I guarantee you, if your designs are beautiful, they'll get managed because people want to be out there looking at them. If they're not beautiful, they won't manage it. So let's talk about beauty for a second. Yeah, there's color. Yeah, there's scent, but also there's stacking. And this is why uh, the cross section, and if you want to go a step further, perspective renders. So if you're taking a look at a, a tableau of what you're looking at, you know, what are the different layers that we're seeing here? So I'm actually just going to turn around. So behind me here is a great example we got a fig tree in the background, which kind of fills this space. We've got a kiwi that's coming up here. And then we have a number of different mints and others that kind of create this bottom level. And so if you take out into the landscape, you really see this bottom. You see this fig that kind of rounds the corner. And then we have our, our top canopy in the background. We've got some cedars back there. It looks like we've got a spruce or two, mostly cedars. We've got a little vine maple over here. So really think about designing and working with aesthetic design. And one of the tricks there is to clump. So clumping in threes and fives and sevens, especially if you're working in a guilds. So like a clump of daffodils, three daffodils, and thinking about you know, tall and slender, kind of high, pretty seasonal, short bloom window. Okay, well, we need something behind that to kind of show off the daffodils because just in space, they look a little naked. So what can go behind there if we're, working with flowers let's work with a hollyhock that gets you know two or three times higher than a than a daffodil and maybe there's some low growing flowers or some thyme or some woolly thyme we can put down there just really start to think of stacking in time and space clumping of threes and fours and when we're working in production i can't say this enough we all think yeah uh, an apple over here and an apple over here and a ribes over here and a ribes over there, current over there. That is terrible for picking. If you're looking to produce food on your landscape, you don't want to spend the most amount of your time going from plant to plant. Um, it's just, it's, it's really frustrating. So generally I'm going to place the plants that are all blooming at the same time or all the same plants together. So that way when the currents are ready, I'm at the currents and I just have to pick the bushes, or when the apples are ready, I've got the apple row, or when the figs are ready, I've got the two or three figs that I'm going to be picking. So really think about clumping together in these three, fours, and fives. You'll find that if you, you know, sort of pointillism, you put a little bit here and a little bit there, it's just a frustrating landscape to manage and to maintain. So those are some of the, the tips and tricks I've picked up over the years. Um, Really think about zonation. Think about these plants and when their harvesting is, when their maintenance is, and make sure that you're putting similar maintenance plants in a similar setting in the zones that are of that frequency of use. So if these are plants that need daily maintenance, zone one, weekly zone two, monthly zone three, sometime over the year zone four, and of course, naturalized area zone five. What other thoughts do I have about that? Well, let's pause for a second and see if um, anybody has questions and I'll take another new. No questions? Okay. I, I put a question that um, Google Doc Okay. And 
I understand it's it's pretty clear to me how to add in the sun angles on a north south cross section. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way to do that to basically predict shade on a base map or on a different cross section that's not necessarily north south. Great question. Yeah, there is a way to do that. So there's there's two ways to do this. One's called a sun shade analysis. And that sunshade analysis is usually of pre-existing plants. And usually what you'll do is you'll use um, either red for sun and blue for shade, and you'll go out and you actually map it. It's a really cool exercise to do. The larger scale is harder, but basically you take your base map and you go and you literally draw out the shade and you do it with like a light shading. And so what you end up with is this really interesting uh, sunshade analysis where you've got your deep blues and your purples and your reds and you get this whole shape and, and scape of what you're looking at. When I'm doing production design and I'm trying to make sure I've I've accounted for the most amount of solar real estate for production uh, plants. So if we're doing rows of apples, rows of, of berries, rows of uh, commercial crops, what I'll do is I'll take a plan view I will understand the heights of those plants at maturity. And then I will understand what the solar, um, uh, the solar shadow is and the sun earth tools calculator that I showcase in the sector analysis has it as an output. So if you put in the dates for the two solstices in your area, it'll give you that, that shade number, um, that, uh, shadow number and then if you know the heights of your plants you can know then what the shadow is going to be and then you can trace an arc around that plant that will then give you a sense of what the shade is of that plant and then let you know how far far away from that you're going to place the next plant so if let's say it's a one to two for your shade ratio in the winter because that shade ratio is going to be greater in the winter um, well let's make it easy one to four so let's say it's one to four and our tree is 10, 10 feet tall. Well, it's gonna be a, a 40 foot radius of shade in the winter. And let's say it's half that in summer. So let's say it's a one to two. So it'll be a 20 foot radius. Well, if our tree is you know, 10 feet wide, then we're going to say from uh, five feet plus 20 feet. So 25 feet to canopy edge. And then another five feet is 30 feet on planting of center. So these two trees will be 30 feet from plant center because they're 10 feet wide and they both cast a 20 foot shadow in summer. And we want to make sure they have optimal summer, uh, summer sun. So that's one of these ways that I do a, a sun analysis when I'm doing, uh, planting, um, planting guides, especially for production farms, because I, I really want to understand what's that shade going to look like. Generally, I don't worry so much about the winter in temperate climates. In tropical climates, it's different. It's a whole different story because normally what we're doing is if we're not in some of the eternal spring-like conditions, which are usually, you know, equatorial or semi-tropics, but into the mountains where we get sort of that same um, I'm looking right now and evaluating um, Ecuador for a client and uh, there's places in Ecuador where it's 6 a.m. sunrise, 6, 6 p.m. sunset year round, 19 to 26 degrees year round. Your, your solar real estate is the same year round. It doesn't change. So it's actually a little bit easier to, to design. But when you get into those areas where summer and winter sun are different and we're still trying to work with production, like in places where we've got monsoon tropics or wet dry tropics, you have to then start to think in the hot season, how then do we have shade covering for everything else? So I designed a site in Cuba where we were using uh, Moringa olifera as a shade crop. So basically it would grow up during the winter and then the summer it would leaf out and it would shade all the understory plants. So it depends on where you are in the world, but sometimes you need to shade out what's underneath you. But generally for that, um, that production model, I'll basically figure out the, the shadow ratio and I'll trace it out just so I know exactly what that's going to look like in summer. Does that answer your question, Shara? Yes, it sounds like something I'm going to need to figure out. <laughs> but yeah, that does. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the steps again is, you know, how high are my trees? What's my shade ratio? 
putting it onto a scale drawing and then just showing what that shading is going to be. And then if we have other production species, so species that we want to produce fruit, especially, you really want to respect that shade, um, that shade collar that ends up around the canopy of the tree. Because if we start to infringe upon that or we start to put, you know, short trees behind tall trees and then we start when we start to go, well, why isn't it producing? Well, it's not producing because it doesn't have um, doesn't have the solar needs uh, available. So great question. Thank you so much. And thanks for directing me back to that. That's great. OK, uh, any final questions? All right, awesome. Well, it's uh, great to see everybody and uh, glad to have the questions. Again, uh, all assignments are due on uh, August 22nd. So you do need to make sure that all assignments are in. Um, there is no extension due to certificates being handed out and programs wrapping and new programs starting. So uh, if anybody needs any help, feel free to reach out, send me an email. Happy to spend some time if folks need a, uh, a moment or two of some uh, direct one-on-one -on -one conversation. And uh, yeah, uh, if there's any final questions about the course or any frustrations, let me know. And uh, with that, I think we'll end off unless anybody has any further comments, queries, questions, or quotations. Easy peasy. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, folks, thanks again. We'll see you in the next one and uh, all the best on the work. Thanks, John. Oh, right. right, you're welcome. Bye. Bye now. Yeah.